Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, we're going to be transforming this damaged iPhone 12 Pro Max into the ultimate piece of luxury technology. While the iPhone's design is respectable, it doesn't stand out amongst the millions of identical phones. So to give it the edge it needs, we'll be installing this new exquisite gold-plated housing inlaid with diamonds. This mesmerizing housing is sure to catch the eye of everyone who sees it. This housing is modeled after the Caviar Solid Gold iPhone, which costs 64,646 Australian dollars. Can we achieve this look for less? I want to find out. The housing in its current state is completely empty and we'll need to have every part of our phone transferred into it. From the logic board and cameras down to the antennas and metal grills in the speaker ports. It's for sure going to be a big undertaking and to do it right I'm going to need to have the right tools for the job. This includes my iFixit ProTech toolkit which houses all the bits and tools needed for this conversion. Thanks to iFixit for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for your own toolkit or parts for your next repair, visit ifixit.com slash hughjeffries or visit the link in the description. To begin, I'll unfasten the two Phillips screws from the bottom of the iPhone and place the device on a heat plate for several minutes to soften the adhesive holding the screen in place. Afterwards, a suction cup can be used to lift up on the display in an effort to create a gap between the display and frame. It took a few attempts and some reheating, but eventually a gap formed. With the plastic pick inserted, it can be worked around the display to cut through that adhesive and unlatch the display's clips. Starting with the iPhone 12, Apple has increased the water resistance on their phones. However, this has made the phone much more difficult to open. With the screen loose, it can be folded to the left-hand side of the phone to reveal the internals and the display's cables. From here, we'll need to remove all of the tri-wing screws, securing in two brackets covering each of these display connections. Once the brackets are free, I'll firstly disconnect the battery before unplugging our front display panel. With the display's cables unplugged, the screen can be lifted up and away from the phone. This gives us our first look inside the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Following the display's removal, I'm going to unfasten the SIM card reader and remove it from the phone. There is a flex cable connecting it to the motherboard, which means not only is it replaceable, but you can install a dual SIM card reader to allow you to install two SIM cards into your iPhone. I've demonstrated this in a previous video with an iPhone 12. I will continue the disassembly by unplugging all of the flex cables connecting to the logic board. There is a total of 14, not including the display cables we removed earlier. Proceeding, there is two standoff screws that will need to come out before we can remove the entire logic board from the phone. Getting a closer look at the logic board, you may have noticed the absence of a connector at the top right. This is only populated on the US models that have extra antennas for 5G millimeter wave. The cameras and LiDAR sensor are to come out next. The LiDAR is secured underneath a bracket and glued to the back casing. With those out, the front facing camera can come out and we can proceed to the lower portion of our iPhone 12 Pro Max. Here I will unfasten the Taptic engine and speaker, which will need to be removed in order to gain access to the battery release tabs. These tabs need to be removed carefully, otherwise they'll break off, leaving the battery stuck inside the phone. The best way to remove them is ensure you're pulling them out horizontally and continue pulling them as close to the battery as possible, limiting the chance of it breaking off at the end. At the top, things are a bit different. There is nothing to remove to gain access to the battery tabs, and with only about 5mm between the battery and a welded bit of metal, I couldn't find a way to remove them, so I resorted to just lifting up the battery. Thankfully, there was minimal adhesive at the top. Back down at the lower portion of the phone, with the battery removed, we can now get out the charging port assembly. There is a lot of screws of various different types that need to come out in order for it to be removed. Thankfully, my ProTech toolkit has the tri-wing, standoff, and Phillips bits to tackle this. Also holding this charging port in place is the plastic guides for the microphone and speaker. With the work of my Jimmy tool, I can pry them free. 
the speaker guide put up a real fight as it's been attached with some really strong glue. Given just how much grief that tiny piece of plastic was giving me, I decided to remove the charging port first so that I didn't damage it whilst trying to remove this piece of plastic. Behind each of those guides are mesh grills. These can be pushed out and put aside for reassembly in our new housing. Proceeding, we can remove the volume and power buttons. These are all connected to one flex cable that also attaches to the wireless charging coil. It's vital that while doing this conversion, I don't damage anything, as many of the parts, even if replaced with brand new ones from a brand new phone, are prevented from fully working. For those who haven't seen my iPhone 12 or 13 repair assessment videos, certain functions of the phone get disabled or various warning messages appear after parts are replaced. The wireless charging module is difficult to remove without damaging it. It's covered by a graphite sticker which can be very easily damaged. Minor damage to that sticker is inevitable, but it doesn't impact the function of the coil. Below it is a series of magnets used for Apple's MagSafe accessories. These are heavily glued down and snap in half very easily. Back up at the top, the LED flash and rear microphone needs to come out next. After removing all the tri-wing screws, it will need to be pried out. It's important to be gentle on these cables as you can slice through them with ease. Having done it myself, it causes a whole week's delay as you need to wait for the replacement part. If you don't organise all the parts you removed properly, it could be a real pain to get it back together. In the crevice next to the camera lens is yet again another antenna. This time it's secured with Phillips screws. Apple is constantly interchanging between these two screw types. I wonder what their decision behind it is. Is there an advantage to using one over the other, or is it just another way to complicate repairs? I find a lot of the common things people would replace, such as the screen, charging port, and cameras, use the Triwing security screw, but some of the antennas and rarely replaced parts do not. Even the screws on the outside of the phone are security screws designed by Apple. After all the antennas are out, there is only a few things left inside this housing. Those include the metal display clips and the volume and power buttons themselves. I'll start by removing the display's clips and then these two gold contacts which sit behind the Face ID module. Lastly, I can remove the spring and retaining clips from the back of each button. This can be achieved using a pair of tweezers and a metal pry tool. With those clips removed, each button can be pushed out of the frame and have each of its rubber grommets removed from it. This is a tiny and complicated process that isn't strictly necessary, although it helps keep dust and water out of the phone. And with that, we've now fully disassembled the iPhone 12 Pro Max. What are your thoughts so far? I don't think this phone was intended to be fully disassembled. To keep everything organised, I've used two iFixit magnetic mats. This allowed me to lay the components out and have their screws stay put and not go rolling off my table. It's finally time to grab our new gold and diamond housing to put all the parts we just removed into it. I'll start with the MagSafe magnets. While I'll be installing them, they'll no longer have any function, just like the wireless charging coil. Both of these systems won't work when you replace the glass with a thick piece of metal. It's now time to prep the buttons before we install them. Using those rubber grommets we removed earlier, I'm going to put them on each of the pegs of each button. Each of the prepped buttons will now be installed into the frame. Our new housing is still covered by a lot of protective film, which I'll be leaving on for the duration of the assembly process. This means we won't get to see the full beauty of this phone until we're done. 
I'll now reattach the retaining bracket and metal spring to each button. Proceeding, it's time to get the display clips reattached. It's vital to install these the correct orientation or you'll assemble the entire phone only to realize the front display panel won't go on. Next, I can go ahead and attach the Wi-Fi antenna back into place. It'll be interesting to see how these antennas perform. Does the metal backplate have an impact on Wi-Fi range or any other antennas in this phone? I guess that's something we'll have to see once we get the phone reassembled. Continuing with our assembly, I'll install the LED flash, rear microphone, and the antenna going beside the camera assembly. I'll also install the metal contacts going behind the Face ID module that'll match in nicely with our new casing. At this point, I'll also cut a piece of thin plastic to sit behind the wireless charging coil. This is to prevent it shorting against the gold. As I mentioned earlier, the wireless charging won't be functional, but we'll still need to install the module itself. I will apply a thin bead of liquid adhesive around the perimeter of the wireless charging module and reattach it into the housing. With the installation of that completed, the remainder of the buttons can be attached. If you're doing something similar yourself, it's important to attach the mute switch to the rocker before installing it into the frame, otherwise it won't function correctly. Down at the bottom of the phone, all of the mesh grills can be reinstalled. While this is a painstaking process, it'll make the housing conversion look complete and professional. Many housing replacements are done poorly and miss parts like these. I do understand why this happens. The iPhone has an excessive amount of pieces when compared to most Android phones, and all of these pieces take time and patience to swap across. Having installed all the tiny pieces, it's time for the larger things. First of which is the charging port and its mass amount of screws holding it in place. After cleaning off the flex cable, the Taptic engine and speaker can be reattached. With that, we can install our logic board back into the phone. At this point, things are starting to take shape. After weaving it through all of the flex cables and securing it down with its two standoff screws, those flex cables can be attached. Proceeding, we can install the SIM card reader back into the device. Unfortunately, I don't have a dual SIM card to swap into this, so it's single SIM for this phone. After connecting its flex cable, it's time to reattach the cameras and LiDAR sensor. Starting with our LiDAR, it can be positioned back into place. After wiping it down, we can reattach its bracket and two screws. Following that, the camera assembly can be put into place. It's important to make sure both the camera itself and the lenses in the housing are free of any dust before doing so. With those three cameras installed, the selfie camera, which is attached to the Face ID module, can be connected back in. It's finally come time to test our custom phone. I'll loosely attach both the battery and display. It's vital to ensure the phone is working before we glue in the battery and display as we risk damaging the phone opening it back up. Pressing and holding the power button, nothing happened. But I expected this as I've encountered this same thing with other iPhone 12s after repair. I'll need to plug it in to the charger to get it to switch on for the first time. After doing so, the phone sprung into life, but the touchscreen isn't working. I'll reseat the display's connection and try again. This issue I encountered highlights the importance of testing prior to closing up the phone, as it was just a simple case of unplugging and plugging back in that fixed the issue. Whether the flex cable just wasn't seated right 
or there is a piece of dust preventing an electrical connection. I don't know, but I could continue testing all the functions of the phone. After testing, it's time to prep the battery for installation. I'll remove the old battery adhesive strips and apply some new ones. It's important that these are applied properly so the battery can be removed if necessary. The battery can finally be installed into the phone and firmly pressed down into place. After which, a new dust and water resistant adhesive seal can be applied into the phone. Despite this, I would never be taking this gold phone near any water, but it will help the display stay firmly attached. It's time for the final stages of assembly. I'll plug in the OLED display and earpiece cable to the logic board before connecting the battery and proceeding to install two brackets that secure all the cables connecting to the logic board. With that, a microfiber cloth can be used to wipe off all of the dust and fingerprints inside the phone before I can remove the protective film for the adhesive going around the display. With that, the 12 Pro Max's display can be seated into the gold housing. I can now go ahead and remove the protective film covering the sides and back revealing the final look to this gold and diamond iPhone. The last thing left to do is install the two pantalobe screws into the bottom of our iPhone and install the SIM card tray. And we're done. So this is it. The iPhone 12 Pro Max in a luxurious gold and diamond housing. With an elegant floral design coated in shiny 24 karat gold and inlaid with spectacular gems, it's sure to dazzle the eyes. After taking this phone to the jewelers, I can confirm it's coated in real gold. However, those gems are only manufactured diamonds, also known as cubic zirconia, which has a close visual appearance to diamonds. This housing was not advertised to have diamonds, and when you factor in the cost of the project, it's not hard to see why. The total spent came to $2,026. That's a staggering $44,620 cheaper than the real Caviar phone. Of course, it's made from solid gold and real diamonds, but if it's the look you're going for, this is almost indistinguishable. I was curious on how the Wi-Fi signal performed with a metal back. It is slightly degraded, and I wasn't able to receive a speed of over 70 megabits per second, which is still faster than you would need on a smartphone. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the custom tech playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.